chapter we looked at in 1 Corinthians was chapter 9. And so this morning we're going to start chapter 10 and uh, see how far we get uh, in these uh, moments we have together. But uh, chapter 10 of, of 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse 1, says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. And then a rather ominous verse, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so in these verses, uh, Paul is, is, is letting us know and teaching us a lesson from the Israelites in that uh, we need to finish well. And uh, many don't. <laughs> In fact, most of the Israelites did not. Uh, we can see through Israel's experience in the exodus from Egypt uh, as an illustration to this principle, but as we look back to all of the fathers that were under this cloud, that received the blessing of, of God in the exodus, they had the cloud of Shekinah glory uh, overshadowing them uh, during their journey from Egypt to the promised land, and, and the cloud sheltered them uh, from the desert sun that was so brutal. And uh, during the night, uh, there was a pillar of, of fire, and, and those, those were a constant reminder of God's presence with them. Uh, it was that, that visual constant reminder uh, and, and we don't have a cloud over us or a pillar of fire, but well, we, we need that constant reminder. Uh, sometimes we just kind of get going through life, uh, tackling our tasks for each day, and we could, go through a, we could go through hours of a day, maybe even days of a week, without acknowledging and realizing God's presence with us. God's with us. God's presence is with us. Sometimes we, we, we can live so much a life completely unaware of that reality. And in the Israelites, even though they had a visual, they had a, a cloud, they had a pillar of fire that was with them, that constant visual, oh yeah, God's with us, they still uh, did not always live in light of that. And so... Um, and we also see that we see God's provision for them in the miracle that they pass through the sea. They pass through uh, the sea. God's incredible power holding back uh, the water so that they could cross on, on dry ground. And then uh, after they, they went through, God releasing that water onto the Egyptian army. And, and, and an amazing demonstration of, of God's love for them, God's care for them, God's power uh, for them. And, 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 and a way to identify, as it were, being baptized into Moses just as the, the water uh, passed through uh, as they identified with Moses, of course, we identify uh, with Christ, uh, the rock. And we even see that in the same, they were eating the same spiritual food to drink. God was also providing for them miraculously uh, food and, and drink during their time in the wilderness. As they uh, roamed during that time, God uh, took care of them. Uh, and, and in the same way uh, that they ate of that spiritual food and drink and, and identified with Moses, again, that points to uh, what we did uh, on Christmas Eve with uh, our allegiance to uh, Christ. And uh, with the, the word sacrament is actually an oath of allegiance is what that word uh, means. And in the same way, uh, we have that, that allegiance when we are baptized when we partake of the Lord's Supper uh, together. Uh, it is that, that oath of allegiance that we 
uh, are identifying with uh, Christ. And so we, they even had the rock, uh, which Paul lets us know that rock that he's referring to is, is Christ. And so uh, despite all of this, despite God's constant presence with us, with them, despite God's daily provision for them, uh, despite God's miraculous work in delivering them from slavery in Egypt, despite all of those spiritual blessings, all of those spiritual privileges that Paul talks about in the first four verses, uh, nevertheless, verse 5 says, uh, most of the Israelites did not live in a way that was pleasing to God. Despite all of their blessings, uh, they weren't grateful for what he had done and did not live lives in, in, in worship and obedience to God as a result of that gratitude. And most of them, uh, where it says most, that's uh, an understatement <laughs> because of all the adult uh, folks that were delivered from Egypt and wandered around in the wilderness, uh, we only have evidence of, of two entering into the promised land of that adult generation, uh, and that's Joshua and Caleb. And so when we say most, <laughs> that's uh, big time most, as, as Joshua and Caleb uh, were the only two adult men from that generation able to enter into uh, the promised land. And so uh, I, I think that needs to be a, a, a warning to, to us because like the Israelites, we have been blessed. We have, uh, God's provided for us. God's presence is with us. And uh, we should live lives of, of gratitude and obedience and worship to God because of that. Uh, shame, shame on Christianity if, if, if it could be nevertheless most did not please God as a response uh, to the way that they lived their lives. Verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And so we're going to go through several ways in which uh, they, uh, they responded wrongly to God's provision. Uh, he's going to give uh, several examples of the way in which they lived. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, some of these are descriptions of, of the Christian uh, church today as well. Now, these things took place as examples that we might not desire evil as they did. Uh, desiring evil, some of your translations may use the phrase lusting uh, after evil, they struggled with being able to say no to their desires, which <laughs> uh, that's a great uh, explanation of our world today. Uh, it's, it's filled with evil desires and a whole lot of people that aren't able to say no to those evil desires. A lot of people that don't have the self-discipline to uh, to say no. Uh, and so they were giving in to their evil lusts or desires, and uh, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And so uh, they also were struggling with idolatry. Uh, they, they failed to keep their focus on God. Uh, despite a cloud, <laughs> despite a pillar of fire, they still struggled with keeping their focus on God, uh, which, uh, man, do we do uh, as well. And so, uh, struggling with, with allegiance to other things, uh, some of them even physical, uh, literal idols. And Verse 8, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. And so we also see that uh, we know how prevalent sexual immorality was in Corinth, uh, where this church was that Paul was addressing. And uh, they, as the people of God, as Israel, 
there in their uh, idolatry were, uh, were engaged in the same sexual immorality uh, and falling, surrendering to the temptation of uh, the sexuality that was around them in, in Corinth. And so we see basically them just giving in to their desires, their, their lust for evil uh, in these ways. We must not put Christ to the test, verse 9, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And so uh, we, we see that even in uh, their lustful desires, they're putting God to the test, they're, they're grumbling, uh, all of those things. And uh, of course, we see uh, the results of their sin. There are other passages in Scripture that talk about a similar number of people uh, falling in, in one day, being destroyed in one day. Numbers chapter 25 talks about a judgment from God in which uh, many, about 23,000, fell in one day. Also, Exodus chapter 32 talks about a number of men falling in, in one day. And so uh, there are similar instances and maybe even... Uh, multiple passages talking about the same instance, uh, but uh, we have these, these warnings uh, from, from God. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And so, I love this. They were, this happened to them, but it's recorded so that what happened to them can be an example to, to even us today, that we should take warning from uh, Israel. And, and we have uh, a great responsibility uh, because uh, we, we, have, we have been blessed uh, to, to have an opportunity to learn from the mistakes of Israel. And it's kind of, you know how you tell your kids, you should know better? <laughs> you, you, you know better. You've been taught better. You have seen uh, this kind of action uh, be disciplined in the past. You should know better. You can't plead ignorance on this. You know better. And in the same way, uh, we should know better. Uh, we, have, we have seen it happen before. We have God's Word uh, that... that tells us uh, what's happened as an example. It's been written down for our instruction. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Uh, which that verse is pointing to pride, right? <laughs> Oftentimes in pride, we think, I got this. Israel was dumb. I wouldn't make that same mistake. And so it's pride uh, uh, that, that, that stands before the fall, and so uh, we should take uh, a, a, a humble approach, acknowledging uh, that that we are sinful, acknowledging that that any strength of resistance to temptation, uh, the same temptations Israel had, any strength that we have is only through the power of God, through His Holy Spirit at work in our lives and our hearts. And you know, we we talk about folks that have fallen morally, and we should never say, well, I'd never do that. Uh, that is the pride that comes before the fall. Uh, we should all acknowledge uh, our propensity to sin and do everything that we can in humility to surrender to God and, and, and protect ourselves from that same moral failure. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Guess what? Any temptation you face, those are the same temptations that Israel faced thousands of years ago. Those same temptations to rely on yourself and not on God. Those same uh, sexual temptations uh, that, that are prevalent today were then as well. Sometimes it takes different forms. You know, the, a lot of sexual temptation now comes through the internet. The internet wasn't around <laughs> as Israel was roaming uh, the wilderness. However, uh, there, there were the same sexual temptations. They've just taken different forms through the years. But no temptation has overtaken that is not uh, common to man. Uh, we, we often want to excuse our particular 
uh, temptings in our particular circumstances, uh, saying that, well, this is an exception. This is different. This is unique. Uh, but, but God reminds us that no temptation is uh, unique. People have faced it before. People will face it again. And uh, we all need to find strength uh, in God to overcome those temptations. I'll read what one commentator said. Others before you have found strength in the Lord to overcome your same temptation and worse. So you can be victorious in the strength of Jesus, not in your own strength. We fight temptation with Jesus' power. Like the girl who explained what she did when Satan came to with temptation at the door of her heart. I send Jesus to answer the door. And when Satan sees Jesus, he says, oops, sorry, I have the wrong house. And so uh, people have fought the temptations we have before us. And, and some of them have overcome those temptations before us. And so that shows us that through the power of Christ, we can overcome temptation in life as we surrender to him. Where did I leave off? Ah, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so uh, we see here that God's promised uh, temptation doesn't have a, a it, it's, it's not uncontrolled. It is not, uh, it is, it, it has, uh, it is supervised by God uh, that he, uh, that we are not uh, given temptation uh, past our uh, capability. Um, Satan would destroy us in a minute. Uh, the only fact that, that he doesn't is that God is not letting him in the same way that he would not uh, let uh, Satan destroy Job and, and Peter uh, and others in Scripture. And also, not only has God promised a, a, a ceiling, as it were, to temptation, but also to provide a way of escape. Uh, God's not only promised to limit temptation, but to provide a way of escape as well. Um, it's not a forced uh, way of escape, but he makes a way of escape available uh, to us. And so um, uh, William Barclay says that the word for a way of escape is really a mountain pass, is, is the literal uh, translation, with an idea of an army being surrounded by the enemy and then suddenly seeing an escape route to safety like a mountain pass. Uh, is that way of escape the easy way? No. Ways of escape are not always the easy path. Sometimes the way of escape from temptation to sin in life is a difficult route. It may be that narrow, difficult road, not the broad, wide one. And so a way of escape doesn't mean an, an easy out, uh, but it's a path out of that temptation that may be difficult. And so... Uh, we've experienced that in, in life as we have made certain decisions in life to, to avoid temptation or to uh, fight temptation. We've had to make difficult decisions in life, uh, haven't we? Whether it's places we don't go or, or people that, that we limit uh, the time we spend with or, or when we get on the computer or what we watch on TV or whatever those decisions uh, we make. Uh, may not always be the easy ones, but uh, they are. It is the way of escape that God has provided for us. All right, a couple more verses. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Uh, here, Paul, in the most literal sense, is speaking of the idolatry that was taking place in the pagan temples in Corinth. Many of them surrounded, uh, many of them included prostitution, the sexual immorality that he was warning about in the previous verses. But uh, we, we know of other uh, things that we idolize in life. Those things that take that place of God in our hearts and in our minds and in our priorities. Uh, whatever those things are that we may uh, 
put in place of God in our lives, whether it's people or, or things or possessions, whatever those are, uh, flee is a strong word. We are to do everything we can within our power to fight against uh, those forms of idolatry in our hearts and in our lives. We're to, we're to flee uh, from those things. It's kind of like in, in, in other passages of Scripture where we're warned to flee from sexual immorality. In other words, <laughs> run as far away from it as we can. Get, get out of there. In the same way, idolatry is, is so significant that we need to do everything we can to rid our lives of it. Uh, and so uh, there were some, some literal applications of, of temple uh, pagan worship for the original audience, but idolatry takes other forms uh, as well. And this opens up uh, a very broad section uh, that it's a whole lot of verses. <laughs> so we'll uh, pause here before we get to, uh, well, I can read them at least. All right, verse 15, I speak as to sensible people, Judge yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we speak is not a participation in the blood of Christ. Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. And so uh, this opens up a, a, a broad spectrum of I speak sensibly to people. Uh, and what he's calling us to is wisdom. He is, as Paul says, I speak to sensible people, to wise men, some of your translations uh, may say. And so uh, Paul's point uh, may seem a little obscure, but in uh, the ancient culture, uh, this would have made perfect sense because they were going to pagan temples to break bread and to drink and to do those things. And so uh, just as the Christian practice of communion speaks to unity, speaks to fellowship with Christ, so these pagan banquets in these pagan temples that they were going to also gives honor to the idols and uh, to, to eat in that banquet, to break that bread, uh, to have that with significant fellowship. Sharing a meal together had significance in the ancient culture. Uh, some of it's a little lost, although I think, uh, I think we value uh, sharing a meal together today, not maybe in the same sense, but, but having a family in your home and sharing that meal is, is an intimate time of, of fellowship. Uh, something a little deeper than you could have just passing by in the hallway on the way to uh, Sunday school. So in the same, in the same way, uh, this is, is significance, whether uh, and he's contrasting what was going on in the temple with uh, believers. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants at the altar? What do I imply then? The food offered to idols is any... That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything. No, I imply that these pagan sacrifices they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be uh, participants with demons. So in the same uh, way that they would uh, have these rituals in the temples uh, to pagan uh, gods, which is ultimately, if you're not worshiping God and you're worshiping these false gods, it's demonic. And so he's equating it to that. And we'll finish here. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And so a strong warning that uh, just as there is significance in, in breaking bread and, and, and having that time at the table <laughs> with the Lord uh, in, in communion, but also in that fellowship, there's, there was a similar significance in the contrary, as, as people were, were drinking and breaking bread uh, with those in these pagan rituals as well. And so a strong uh, warning in, in these verses uh, to not do that. And so uh, we do not want to provoke the Lord to uh, jealousy. What, uh, and so um, we will pause there and begin uh, verse 23 next week 
We'll start with verse 23 in the year 2023. I haven't gotten used to writing 22 as the year uh, when I have to date things. And now all of a sudden it's 2023. Crazy. Fun fact, January, next week, uh, January will mark 10 years I've been here. I didn't even realize that Hayes told me. <laughs> she said, you know, we, we went to Westside in 2013, which will be uh, 10 years in January. Uh, I didn't realize it had been that long. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, so that's a chunk of my life, 10 years. Whoa. All right. One out of every four days of my entire life is spent right here. And I'm happy that, uh, for that. Uh, it's been a blessing also. So. We didn't even have kids when we started here. It's crazy to think. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for this example that we have uh, that has been uh, protected and, uh, in your word that you have uh, brought to us for, for a moment like this that we can be reminded of your constant presence in our lives. And Father, uh, help us to not become so comfortable with that truth that we fail to acknowledge it. Help us to live, even today, in light of the fact that your presence is always with us. And so, Father, acknowledging that presence, may we, may we live out uh, your calling on our lives today to be the hands and the feet of Christ uh, to those that we interact with this week. Father, we pray as we anticipate a new year in a few days. Father, we thank you that your presence will go with us in 2023, uh, that, that you are the rock that is with us in Christ, that you are that cloud of protection over us, that you are that pillar of fire that guides us. And so, Father, we pray for that uh, again in this next year. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.